In this video, I'll be talking about the character Candy from Of Mice and Men, and I'll be exploring different aspects of his character and how you might want to include some of these ideas into an essay should you need to write about him in a, in a future exam. It's worth noting at this point that I typically uh, teach according to the Edexcel IGCSE English Literature Exam Mark Scheme. Um, so you may note I give lots of attention to context because it's worth 50% of the, of the exam. Um, just have a little review. If you're doing maybe AQA or Cambridge, you may want to um, review your mark scheme and just make sure everything that I cover is relevant to your exam as well. But certainly the aspects that I talk about um, in terms of Candy's character will be relevant regardless of your exam board. So first of all, let's think about the fact that he's the weakest member or one of the weakest members on the ranch. And that's immediately clear by his first description. We're told that he's a stoop-shouldered old man. So he's physically weighed down by the relentless work and poor living conditions. Um, you could also talk about how that's metaphorical as well. Is he, is he metaphorically weighed down by um, his oppression? Um, look at the way he moves around the boss. He shuffles. Um, so he moves around almost like a frightened animal and that indicates subservience. And this is really an important moment when we see the man at the very top of the hierarchy next to the man at the very bottom. And we're very much uh, reminded that there is a very clear hierarchy on this ranch. And that actually represents society at large in 1930s USA as well. And we'll come back to that a little bit later when we look at context. Um, we also find out very quickly that he is disabled. He's got a stick-like wrist and no hand. Hands in this novella are often used as a symbol of power. As an example, Lenny's paw symbolises his animal-like strength. So the fact that Candy has no hand really helps emphasise how powerless he is. And of course, practically, this injury places him in a very weak position on the ranch because it limits the use he has for the boss. And power is all about how useful you are in this society. Candy looks at Slim to try and find some reversal. Now, this is when um, the discussion comes up about whether his dog is going to be euthanized or not. Now, rather than Candy just putting his foot down and saying, no, I don't want him to be killed, he looks to Slim and hopes that Slim will say, no, that can't happen. It's really interesting that he feels like he has no say in the fate of his dog, and that really helps stress how powerless he feels, how voiceless he feels, even when discussing the, the future of his, of his own dog. And even Curly's wife, who is another weak member on the ranch, says that he is a lousy old sheep. And that insult really mirrors the way he is viewed on the ranch, or maybe even just in general in society, because his age uh, makes him um, to be considered useless, at least on the ranch. So when you're talking about context, you'll want to note that Candy is particularly vulnerable for two, two reasons. One, that he is old, and the other, because he is disabled. And that very much links to um, how vulnerable the elderly and the disabled were in 1930s America. So the elderly, let's start with them, they were particularly hard, hit hard during the Great Depression. They lost all their life savings uh, during the Wall Street crash and that pretty much threw them back into employment or um, it meant it cancelled their retirement. It meant they had to continue to work into old age. And there was no elderly relief provided uh, before 1935. And actually, even when it was introduced by 1935, it wasn't given to anyone who was involved in farm or domestic work. And those were, you know, some of the poorest in society. So it didn't help the most vulnerable. Um, so with very little help provided by the government, really, it was expected that f your family should look after you, your daughter, your son, your 
brother or whoever, whoever you have, whatever living relations, they should be helping to look after you. But remember, this is the Great Depression. Everybody is struggling. So suddenly, young families are expected to look after the elderly members of their, fa- uh, of their family. And actually, many of them just couldn't. They didn't have enough money to stretch that far. And of course, now that they're back onto the, um, to the, the, uh, into, empl- into employment, sorry, um, they faced really tough competition because unemployment had reached um, as high as 25% um, during the 1930s. So there's, there's even more people looking for a job. And of course, if you're elderly, you have to compete with the, the younger in that workforce as well. And so you're not going to be very competitive. Um, it was also harder, or you might say even even more um, difficult for those who had disabilities. So the overall in- unemployment rate for disabled people was upwards of 80%. And of course, that meant that they were facing absolute crushing levels of poverty. So Candy is an extremely vulnerable character. And because of that, he is seen as disposable. Um, he knows that as well he repeatedly says I ain't much good so he's very much aware of the comparatively few skills he has to offer which has affected his self-regard he puts himself down Um, and look at how he talks about his sheepdog he's holding on to the past god he was a good sheepdog and that really draws parallels between Candy and his old dog. Candy holds on to mem- memories of what a skillful dog he once was, but past accomplishments are useless in the world of capitalism where your worth is determined by how productive you are today. And that really, really draws a parallel because the sheepdog is viewed by everyone else on the ranch as a burden. And that's the way Candy is viewed he's a burden and or he will be when he can no longer provide a service to the ranch and of course that's also mirrored in in the suggestion why why don't you just get candy to shoot his old dog and give him one of the pups to raise up so just like the sheepdog is viewed as replaceable by a puppy soon candy will be replaced by a younger worker this is an important reminder actually to all workers not just candy that they are vulnerable they will all grow old eventually and no one's going to care to help them to support them they'll be thrown off the ranch just like candy anticipates and we see that um in the next quote where he says just as soon as i can't swamp out no bunkhouses they'll put me on the county here he's talking to lenny and george um as he they're talking about the dream of of owning a ranch so he's very much aware of his vulnerable vulnerable position on the ranch and how easily he will be disposed of as soon as he can no longer provide a service so it's a really cutthroat society and you might link this to this whole idea this whole belief system in social darwinism and it's there's an argument that the industrial capitalism really supported this idea and it's basically a belief in survival of the fittest the idea that certain people become powerful in society because they are innately better Um, and this really was used to justify such things as imperialism racism eugenics social inequality Um, at various times in history and as well during the 1920s and 1930s and so this belief left no room for compassion for the likes of Candy whose struggles would have been considered a natural order of things so they wouldn't look at Candy and go you know what I feel some social responsibility that I should support someone like that I should help them they would just go well that's life there's going to be some people that are going to be more powerful and better off than others and that's just the way of life that's natural and that's the way that people kind of excused um, their apathy. If you look at the relationship of Candy and his dog, you can draw parallels with George and Lenny. So we notice that the dog never leaves Candy. He's at his heels. um, And so the dependence of the dog and Candy mirrors the dependence of Lenny on George. We rarely see Lenny on his own. And if we do, he looks very lost. Um, Both relationships, however, even though there's a dependence, both relationships are symbiotic and what I mean by that is they both 
gained something. Both parties gained something from this relationship. So while the dog and Lenny gained protection and guidance from their masters, and obviously by masters I mean George in, in terms of Lenny and George, Candy and George gained companionship. So it really sets them apart from the other characters on the ranch who live a life of solitude. So they do have some sort of companionship. It's quite sad, though, that Candy's only companion is a dog. Um, and of course, you might want to highlight here that this isn't really a genuine friendship for Candy and the dog or George and Lenny. It's a friendship that's been born out of a desperate situation. We know that George and Lenny aren't really pals. They don't have a... Um, a connection an intellectual connection but they need each other because they don't want to be alone and that's certainly the same case uh, with candy and his dog and this is a really important quote when he's reflecting on the fact that he has allowed a stranger to kill his dog to shoot him and he says to George I ought to have shot him myself I ought to have not let no stranger shoot my dog and we should know hopefully by the end of this novella that George um, shoots Lenny so this foreshadows but more than that it justifies the decision that's eventually made by George it was the kindest thing he could have done there was no way that Lenny was going to get away f without some sort of um, torture this was the kindest way to um, to end Lenny's life so George took it in his own hands but we have that kind of echoing in our ear what Candy said his biggest regret was that he didn't shoot the dog himself um, because then it would have been a kind of euthanasia it would have been a merciful killing um, it also brings this idea of this inevitability in Lenny's death that it's coming we uh, have that kind of ominous feeling as well um, so thinking about the fact that he does at least have some companionship, it sets him apart from the other workers. And that was unusual at this time because of the high demand for work amongst migrant workers. There was, there was, it created this really competitive and hostile environment. So it meant people weren't friends. They saw each other as, as each other's competition. But of course, it's the transient lifestyle as well of the migrant worker, the fact that they do have to keep on the move that made it really difficult to form long-term friendships and especially to have a family. So these men just led very lonely lives. He is prejudiced. He, we notice he's quite a gossip as well, isn't he, when he talks about Curly's wife. Uh, he calls her a tart, and at the end, when she's just been killed by Lenny, he calls her a goddamn tramp. So his, his misogynistic attitude towards Curly's wife serves to highlight the unequal treatment of women at the time. His accusation of her being a tart is completely unfounded. Remember, we don't know anything about Curly's wife other than the fact that she does walk around the ranch and try and start conversations. But she's done nothing else beyond that. Um, and his emotionless reaction to her death She's just been killed by Lenny, yet he calls her a goddamn tramp and blames her. And that normalises violence against women and really again highlights um, the views of women at that time. And then, of course, he, he seems to like Crooks. He calls him a nice fella, but very shortly after that, he refers to him with that racial slur beginning with an N-word, at uh, the end letter And um, so the juxtaposing descriptions that Candy gives Crooks, okay, so he's a nice fella, but then he also calls him the N-word. So this casual use of derogatory language reveals how deeply entrenched racism was in the in 1930s society. So much so that people like Candy, who doesn't even think he's saying anything to be mean about um about crooks because he's saying he's a nice fella is actually saying something that adds to his oppression um so it just highlights how normalized racism was as well um so it's important i think steinbeck does a really good job in of mice and men of creating really complex characters he's very very careful not to create a character that is completely likable or completely blameless um, and he d does this with candy with these examples there are aspects of candy's personality that isn't very likable um and through this he's stressing the complexity of mankind and he's also you know, using this as an opportunity to explore our flaws as human beings. 
Uh, so you might link Candy's unfounded anger towards Curly's wife as a as a representative of a patriarchal world where men are fixated on dominating women. What is he really upset about? He's upset about the fact that she's outside of the house where she belongs, and I obviously do that in quotation marks. Um, he's upset that she's wearing makeup. He's upset that she's speaking to men. These are all things that s- suggest that he doesn't like the fact that this woman doesn't seem under control. Um, and then, of course, racism is clear in his dialogue uh, when talking about crooks. And this was an everyday part of life in the southern states at this time in the 1930s. It was accepted and it was encouraged. Even though slaves at that point had, had been free for about 50 years, um, the novella really highlights that attitudes towards blacks hadn't changed at all. And we are f- clearly see that in his speech. And like many um, of the characters, um, he's also a dreamer. When he hears George and Lenny talk about the ranch and it seems like it's going to happen, his eyes are blinded with tears. He leans forward eagerly. So there's a noticeable change in his posture, in his demeanour, and that stresses the excitement over this prospect of, of the ranch. He longs, the ranch really represents companionship and protection for him, and that's what he longs for. And then after Lenny's death, you know, you could also see this as, um, again, he's he's almost quite ruthless. Lenny's just um, not Len- Lenny hasn't died, but Lenny's in trouble, I should say, and it's just after Curly Curly's wife's death. He says, you know, to George, you know, we're still going to get that place, aren't we? We can still live nice, can't we, George? Can't we? And he's clinging on to the dream, despite how unlikely it is now. His continual questioning reveals how desperate he is for this dream to come true, as it really offers the only escape he has from this cruel world. So the dream of owning a ranch is a symbol of the American dream and the failure of Candy's dream to come true highlights how unattainable the American dream was during the Great Depression, but it also emphasises the necessity of having dreams to make life bearable. Candy's life is awful. He's got nothing to look forward to. At some point, he's going to be thrown out of the ranch and no one's going to look after him. He's going to have no elderly relief. He has no relatives. He's going to be completely on his own, experiencing absolute crushing poverty. And so this just gave him a glimmer of hope. So always think about what you think the overall message is or the overall intention that um, Steinbeck had in creating um candy as a character so here are a few ideas is he a representation of some of the most vulnerable groups in the u.s during the 1930s so we're here we're talking about the elderly and the disabled he does um, help highlight the inequalities in the workplace and the fundamental flaws of the social and economic system of the 1930s America. So, you know, the the flaw of having a capitalist system where it's where there is no compassion for those that need extra protection. Of course, we've just talked about it, the unattainability of the American dream in the 1930s. It's not just about how hard you work. Some people will never make it. Um, also, you know, is he there to help us explore human nature? This idea that power is born out of weakness. He gains a little bit of power by uh, gossiping about Curly's wife and talking down at her. He gains power by referring to crooks uh, with the N word. Um, So there's this element of, is this the way the world works? The only way to be powerful is to make people weak. And Candy is one of those victims. Um, but of course there's plenty more that you could talk about I didn't really talk about the fact that he's a gossip and he actually likes he enjoys gossiping because it gives him um, a connection with George Um, there's also moments where he does try and speak up against Curly Um, he speaks up against Curly's wife as well there's just moments when he tries to have a bit more power so you could have a look at those sections as well Um, and feel free to share your ideas if there's anything else that you think would be worthy to include in an essay about candy Uh, please feel free to share your ideas in the comment section